Good evening. Excuse me. Good morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Mr. President, welcome, uh, cosmonauts and astronauts. Depending on where you're standing, you can see uh, all three of the vehicles in our manned space program. Uh, the very small Mercury over there, the Gemini behind us, the Apollo. You might just want to take a minute to wander around here and... Uh... It is our nature to explore, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. In mid-July, two Soviet cosmonauts and three American astronauts will go into orbit above the Earth and join their capsules in space. Apollo-Soyuz is the mission, the name of a Greek god and the Russian promise of friendship. And so we are joined in this mission of science. In summary, we are on schedule to meet the launch date next July, and we see no problems at this time. Everything is okay. of the satellite tools that they can hurl a, uh, an object a considerable distance. Here, uh, three months after Sputnik, a cat gets its eyes open in nine days. I understand that an observation was made that there was some disappointment about the timetable in the rocket and missile field. We're lagging in both uh, the satellite and missile field. Our satellite program has never been conducted as a race with other nations. Rather, it has been carefully scheduled as part of the scientific work of the International Geophysical Year. November 3rd, 1957. Program to be the Soviet Union today launched a second satellite, Sputnik 2, at 1,120 pounds, with a dog, Laika, aboard. Vanguard 1, America's first satellite stands ready. It seemed as if all the gates of hell had opened up. Brilliant stiletto flames shot out from the sides of the rocket. Agonizingly, we hesitated, and in front of our unbelieving shocked eyes began to topple. This is Steve Douglas at Vanguard Press Site. In January, Explorer 1, our first satellite, went into a successful orbit. Now we're awaiting another Vanguard launch here at the and, Cape. Uh, I said Today's weather is just perfect. 1958, a United States Navy Vanguard puts a four-pound satellite in orbit. A new agency, NASA, is formed from the internationally respected National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And the thrust into space seems now to be toward the moon. The Pioneer launches, a double series, one to circle the moon and the other to strike it. One by one, all four fail. But another pioneer goes by the moon to enter into a sun orbit. The United States readies four more moon probes. The results are the same. And none of the payloads even reach the Earth orbit. Earlier, the Soviet Union had launched Sputnik 3, a space laboratory weighing almost 3,000 pounds. Now the USSR is ready for the moon. The first attempt fails. And then, on September 12, 1959, Lunik 1 
hits the moon. And Lunik 3 orbits the moon, transmitting photographs of the hidden side. 17 months later, the USSR launches the first Venus probe, Sputnik 8. It fails when its radios go dead a week out on the three-month voyage. The Soviet Union would launch 13 Venus and Mars probes before they have a success. were not to attempt Venus until July 1962. The first rocket veers off course and has to be destroyed. Now, there are just 50 days while Venus and Earth are in position for a launch. Mariner 2 is launched July 26th. The results are extremely gratifying to the world scientific community. On August 12, 1960, a flight takes place which truly proves that man can work in space. Robert White flies to 136,500 feet, a place out of the atmosphere in near space where aircraft controls do not work and space reaction controls take over. A year later, the X-15 flies to 246,700 feet with pilot Joe Walker and then to almost 60 miles up with Bob White. Again, the Soviet Union takes a commanding position, this time in manned orbital flight with the mission of Yuri Gagarin, April 12, 1961. Two failures of unmanned test vehicles precede this flight. One burns up on re-entry into the atmosphere, and the other, on a signal to re-enter, instead goes into a higher orbit and is lost. The United States Project Mercury astronauts are selected, and the usual press conference introduces them. The schedule is plagued with repeated failures. Then, Alan Shepard is launched into a ballistic arc. Again, I express my congratulations uh, to Alan Shepard. Uh, we're uh, very proud of him, and I speak on behalf of uh, the Vice President, who is Chairman of our Space Council, and who bears great responsibilities in this field, the members of the House and Senate Space Committee, who are with us today, and uh, this decoration, which has gone from the ground up, here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I was far further in between. You couldn't get any closer, and I couldn't get in. Gus Grissom's narrow escape. He's almost lost during recovery. Get in, get in close enough for me to get hold of the swing, and then uh, everything was pretty good with me. Made certain that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution, the first waves of modern invention and the first wave of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. In August, German Titov makes 16 orbits. His rapturous, I am eagle, is typical of the elation both cosmonauts and astronauts experience in space. You have firing signal. Good Lord, ride all the way. Godspeed, John Glenn. Six, five, four. We have seen nothing like the public acclaim given to U.S. astronaut John Glenn as a result of the press, radio, and television coverage of his three orbits of Earth. Roger, we're programming it roll okay. I spoke to some people in the, in the crowd, people who were here in 1927, 35 years ago, when they had that great parade for Colonel Lindbergh, and they tell me that it was nothing like this. They've got more people, more chicken things. We are all proud to have been privileged to be part of this effort to represent our country as we have. As our knowledge of this universe in which we live increases, may God grant us the wisdom and guidance to use it wisely. Thank you, sir. 
The first space cooperation between the United States and the USSR comes in the fields of meteorology and communications. Data from weather satellites will be exchanged. This agreement is signed by Dr. Hugh Dryden and academician Blagonravov. The United States orbits astronaut Carpenter, then Chirac, and then the last launch in Project Mercury, Gordon Cooper's, which expands the envelope of United States manned spaceflight experience. The Soviet Union is now concerned with the problems of multiple flights and rendezvous. They launched Nikolaev and then Popovich in Vostok 3 and 4, then Bukovsky and Tereshkova in Vostok 5 and 6. Valentina Tereshkova as she goes into orbit. This is Seagull. I feel fine and cheerful. I see the horizon. A pale blue strip. It's the Earth. How beautiful it is. Later, she is to marry Kosmov Nikolaev and to give birth to a daughter. The United States launches a series of amazingly successful satellites for meteorology, navigation and communication. But American attention is focused in the direction of the moon. There were early failures. Then, Rangers 7, 8 and 9 return spectacular television pictures of the moon right up to the moment of impact. But Hod 1 carries the first three-man crew into space, a pilot, an engineer, and a physician. The pilot, Kamarov, is to die in a later flight when his parachute lines foul, the chute doesn't open. Then cosmonaut Alexei Leonov startles the space-watching world with his trip outside his spacecraft in orbit. The Soviets call it a spacewalk. Ten space flights called Gemini produce the kind of technical experience needed to put astronauts on the moon. The highlight event is Edward White's spacewalk. You could almost not drag me in, but I'm coming. You still got three and a half more days to go, buddy. I know. Two years later, White is dead in a disastrous fire in a ground test of an Apollo capsule. Lost also are astronauts Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee. Now the landing on the moon and Project Apollo is to wait while technicians study the fire and the spacecraft. The United States and the Soviet Union sign agreements to publish a joint review of research in space biology and medicine. And lunar orbiter photographs the proposed landing sites and more than 99% of the surface area of the moon. Five surveyor spacecraft soft land on the moon. The results indicate the composition of the lunar soil and that a spacecraft like the Apollo lunar lander can be supported on the surface. The Soviet Union decides not to attempt a manned landing on the moon, but to explore with unmanned spacecraft and robot vehicles, like these models. February 3rd, 1966, Luna 9 makes a soft landing on the lunar surface. And Luna 10 orbits the moon providing good photographs. December 26th, Luna 13 soft lands and reveals surface bearing pressures. Zond 5 re-enters Earth's atmosphere and a payload of animals is recovered after an eight day circumlunar voyage. And God called the dry land Earth. 1968. And God saw it the is Christmas Earth. Day. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good Earth. <laughs> Ancient time, since the beginning of man's ability to think, 
he has gazed at the heavens and dreamed that someday he would travel through space to explore the moon and planets which have eternally captivated his imagination. Today the dream has been realized. We are on the moon. With Promethean ability, both nations have demonstrated beyond all doubt that man can perform useful functions in space. Now the United States and Soviet Union agree to design compatible rendezvous and docking equipment. And then, the two nations sign an historic agreement for cooperation in the exploration of outer space. The political symbolism is brought home to each of us by the Apollo Soyuz mission, when astronauts and cosmonauts will be orbiting the Earth dependent on each other's life support systems. I would like to introduce to you our honored guest this evening. We've all read about the cosmonaut astronaut team preparing for joint space exploration next July. They are with us this evening. In the box level, will you join and we watch these well young men, right. these representatives of us, from two cultures, as they learn to work together. A meeting with President Ford and an invitation by the President to a Virginia Crab Fest. There is the possibility of some cultural shock in both countries. To fly with a man, you must know just what kind of a man he is. And so we watched each other. We ate space food, green chi, borscht, heart show. rocket, our very big one that goes to the uh, the moon, we have shown just with a model over here on the wall. And uh, I learned English about seven months. We looked During over each period. other's spacecraft. That time. Alexei Leonov, the command pilot of Soyuz, is 41, a colonel in the Red Air Force, graduated from Chuguyev Air Force School with distinction. He is a gifted artist. Tom Stafford, command pilot of Apollo, is 45, a brigadier general in the Air Force and a graduate of the Naval Academy. starting to work together in procedures. We have a working relationship that's quite good with the Soviet Union. I'm sure it's going to continue. There will be eight NASA flight controllers in Soviet mission control during the mission. In working sessions at Houston and at the Gagarin Center for Cosmonaut Training, we got to know each other and to respect different methods for the same job. Eight Soviet flight controllers will be at Mission Control Houston during the flight. To know a man, if you're going to work with him, fly 225 kilometers up for about two days, you should know something about his land.
Valerie Cabasso, flight engineer for Soyuz, is 40. A mechanical engineer, he flew in 1969 on Soyuz 6 for 118 hours. He's a civilian. Vance Brand, another Apollo crew member, is also a civilian. He's been a test pilot for a number of years, has a master's from UCLA and two bachelor degrees from Colorado. He's an aeronautical engineer. Apollo Soyuz is designed to test a universal docking system. That's the primary purpose. If there are to be other joint missions in the future, we'll need a way of joining the space capsules. There is a possibility that some future mission in space will have difficulty and be in serious trouble. We will need this universal docking system to effect the rescue. The language barrier is gradually coming down. Cosmonauts will speak English and astronauts Russian. Deke Slayton, a civilian and 51, is the third man on the Apollo crew. He flew in World War II and was one of the first seven astronauts. It was thought that he had a minor heart problem, and in 1972, he was returned to full flight status in time to prepare for this mission. This satellite, the Applications Technology Satellite, now in synchronous orbit above the equator at 22,000 miles, will be used for all Apollo-Soyuz mission communications. The first phase was theoretical. It started in Houston last July. It ended in Moscow last November and December. The second phase, which is now working on all the normal operations, like the end of rendezvous, the transfer of the crews, the working of the cameras, all the training procedures was initiated in Moscow last June. It finished in the early part of July, and now it's continuing on in Houston. General Vladimir Shatilov, Chief of Cosmonaut Training, has flown twice in space and was designated by the Soviet Union as the leader of the Outer Space Squadron in the joint flight of Soyuz 6, 7 and 8. Other pilots and engineers will serve as backup crews. Anatoly Filipchenko, Alan Bean, Nikolai Rukovishnikov, Ronald Evans, Vladimir Janibekov, Jack Lausma, Boris Andreev, Yuri Rumanenko, and Alexander Ivanchenko. Very good time in Washington. Thank you very much. A close comradeship has developed between the crew members as a result of shared experiences, training, and social. The Soviet Soyuz rocket will lift off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan at 1220 Greenwich Mean Time, July 15th. Seven and a half hours later, the United States will launch Apollo from the John F. Kennedy Space Center. The two spacecraft will begin a series of maneuvers to prepare for rendezvous and docking of Soyuz and Apollo. Docking will occur prior to darkness and during the 36th orbit of Soyuz 
and Apollo's 29th revolution of Earth. The rendezvous procedure calls for the Soviet crew to establish a near-perfect circular orbit at 225 kilometers. The American Apollo crew will close and initiate contact with Soyuz. Scientific experiments will be conducted by the crews on a joint basis. Now with Apollo Soyuz, we open the way to a true partnership within the family of man on this spaceship Earth.